Um, why don't we talk about maths? Yeah. Right. My favourite subject. Good. Is it really? Oh, I hadn't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> so let's pretend it's January again. And, you know, the most okay. thing we've got to worry about is whether parts of the royal family have had enough with the press and moved to uh, <laughs> left the country. God, um, I forgot on those things. Yeah, those a thousand days. years ago. <laughs> what, what did you do with your day? What, uh, <laughs> what, what was your job day to day? Well, actually, so in January, I was still on maternity leave, All right. um, which inevitably meant, okay. <laughs> which inevitably meant uh, writing books and touring the world, doing, <laughs> doing uh, public speaking. Let's go back um, a little so... bit further then. Um, <laughs> and, it, it's, and this is a serious question that I was talking to someone about the other night. Um, someone like Brian Cox, very yeah. famous science communicator. Yeah. You know, I've heard yeah. through the grapevine, he doesn't do as much actual science and research as he used to because he's his job is mainly being you know yeah. superstar communicator now um, you're in a, a similar position so I guess the question is do you have much time to do the, the the research or is so much of your time now spent communicating that that's you might prefer it you might not um, but yeah yeah what, I think it's yeah I think it's important to be uh, to be honest about these things because um, there are only so many hours in the yeah. day and, uh, you know, there's only, I can't, it just wouldn't be physically possible to keep research at the level that I was at before, mm. um, you know, pre doing any of this stuff is, is the time has to come from somewhere. Um, but that said, I still teach, I still have PhD students, I still have a, a whole range of PhD students, I still have a master's course that I run. Um, and I still try and do as much research as I can, because ultimately, that's the bit that uh, that's the bit that gives me the most joy yeah, in a yeah. lot of ways. I mean, and what is the area um, of maths that that that's in? What, what area of maths do you love most? So I like to think of myself as intellectually promiscuous, <laughs> <laughs> which which means that I like. Uh, for me, it's all about the techniques and the methods, and then the uh, the area that you apply it in actually doesn't necessarily matter that much. But so broadly speaking, I mean, top level thing is it's about patterns in human behaviour. But more specifically, it's about it's about patterns that change in space and time. So it's about um, it's about I mean, so my my post is uh, I'm an associate professor in the mathematics of cities. So if you can think of all of the various ways, all of the various patterns that humans might create across a city, those are the things I'm interested in. So in the past, I've worked on. Um, you know, shopping behaviour. Uh, I've worked on uh, rioting. Um, I've worked on burglaries, uh, on terrorism, um, uh, also on infectious disease stuff. Actually, I did um, some work a little while ago about <laughs> about uh, badgers and uh, TB in right. badgers, which I mean, it sounds like it sounds like these things are very far apart, right? It sounds like TB in badgers and terrorists. Um, or, you know, or riots, they feel like they're worlds apart. But what you have to think about is that actually both of them involve something that is moving around in space and time and having an effect on the environment around it. But how did you get, what kind of maths do you use in, in this kind of space and time stuff? Okay, so my background is in fluid dynamics. So that's really modeling heavy. Um, that's really where you are trying to translate a version of the world into a mathematical description. So there's a lot of that. Um, there's also my postdoc was in complexity theory, which is about uh, is about large scale patterns that emerge from smaller scale rules. So a really good example of this is um, if you look at the way a crowd behaves. So you can think if you're like watching down, you're looking down um, on a crowd of people, perhaps going through a corridor, for example. Um, and every individual feels like they're they're operating with their own free will, making their own decisions. Yeah. But of course, the reality is that what we're all doing is just following the person in front yeah. of us. Um, and so as a result, these these lanes of traffic form. Right? No one sets the rules, but um, these lanes of traffic form just from nowhere. So so that's what complexity um, is all about. And then beyond that, actually, there's a lot of data analysis. There's a lot of machine learning. Um, and it's really plugging in all of those things together. A lot, a lot, a lot of statistics as well. Yeah. Um, it's really plugging in all of those things together. Um, um, w within that area, I mean, fluid dynamics, it, it's all making perfect sense now. We are all droplets sure. Sure. in the ocean of humanity. Um, I think I'll <laughs> copyright that. That sounds quite good. Um, but, uh, I did maths at A-level. I did pure and applied, and I preferred the pure because it was kind of conceptual. And then I had to do it as part of my... 
degree course when I did computer science because there wasn't enough computer science to fill the first year. So I did part computer science, part geology, go figure, and part mm -hmm. maths. And they completely lost me. I mean, they got rid of numbers by Christmas. Seriously, I think zero hung around till January or February, but numbers disappeared. And, you know, and for me, that went above what I was, was capable of, of understanding. But the, the, the really abstract maths... Is it a case that occasionally they find a use for it? Or is it more that you only research the areas where there is kind of some use and, and some grant anyway? I'm just wondering how the more abstract and pure and, and niche parts of maths can be useful. Yeah, yeah. So, OK, so I think that that, that split between pure and applied is kind of an interesting one. Because I think that in in many ways, they're both the same thing. I think that the applied maths takes the world and tries to transcribe it into a series of equations and then bends it and twists it and stress tests it and, and just tries to see what you can do with it when you manipulate it in a whole series of different ways. And I think that pure maths actually is doing exactly the same thing. But the difference is that the world that they begin with isn't the one that we live in. It's an yeah. imaginary one. And I think that um, to a pure mathematician, so I'm very much an applied mathematician, certainly you know, human behavior, it's like it's very much anchored in, in reality. Um, but I think to a pure mathematician, this idea of use, this idea of function actually doesn't really come into it. It's yeah. about, it's there's something quite romantic and poetic about these very deep ideas and finding these, because when you do explore that world, you are in no doubt that it's that you are exploring and not creating yeah. you are you are discovering stuff you are not inventing it um and it is very uh, i think satisfying to explore these mazes these logical mazes um to explore these sort of paths that are laid out ahead of you uh and being the first person to explore it i think there's something really exhilarating in that and it just so happens every now and then you know a hundred years later a physicist will be thinking of a problem and will find this like weird version of like what space is 22 dimensional or you know they need to like manipulate numbers in this slightly weird way and they'll be sitting in the next door office to uh you know some yeah. mathematician who knows about i don't know lee algebra or something and then the two this bridge will form between the two yeah. and then suddenly all of that pure math stuff gets ported over into the real world and that has um, happened but that's hasn't it i, think I mean i i can think yeah, of yeah, with totally. my basic knowledge i know that complex numbers right the square root of minus one yeah like this imaginary number i actually is is completely we we need it for um electronics don't we we need it for yeah. i don't know how it how it, it works within that but if we didn't have complex numbers so but yeah. the, but that can't mean that complex numbers actually exist in the world does it or is it just well, the math that helps don't us to, I, I don't know. know i don't know i don't know i don't know, <laughs> I don't know. I kind of think if you need them, just because you can't point at them, um, you know, does hope exist? You can't point at hope either. Can you? I like that. <laughs> it's like, it's like, um, and then there was the thing like about um, Fermat's last theorem was finally solved using a really cutting edge, like graph technique or something, you know, not very long ago. Yeah, and, like curves. Um, I don't think Fermat really solved it all those years ago. Do you? Where he wrote in the no. margin is that a kind of established fact now? That was just like that was maybe not facts, but I think that people. So um, uh, Cauchy, a very famous mathematician, French mathematician, a number of years later, um, believed that he had solved Fermat's last theorem, and um, I think people widely suspect that uh, he'd made a mistake though. Yeah. Um, in fact, I I can't totally remember, but I think the mistake may have been something to do with complex numbers. Right. Um, but uh, I think that I have to double check that again. Um, um, but uh, yeah, Koshi made a mistake. Koshi made a mistake, and I think it's widely believed that Fermat had fallen into the same trap as Koshi had a number of years later. Because Fermat just wrote in the in the, the you know beside his text, yeah, I think I've solved this. I won't bother you with the solution. But uh, yeah. yeah, anyway, I have an elegant solution to this that the margin is too narrow to contain. It's lovely. Yes. Um, and interesting, you just mentioned something I wanted to ask you about there. Um, you, you did another series of programs about, I think, the joy of numbers a few a few years ago. And I think you asked in that, is maths discovered or invented? 
And what you've just said mm. there about pure mass, you are discovering things, you're not creating things. And I just wanted to ask you, do, do you think when we're talking about things like the square root of minus one, that's a concept. Is that a concept that we have invented? Um, and, and to go further, right, quantum physics and quantum mechanics, where we say we, mm. certain things are unknowable in quantum theory. We mm. cannot know the position of a particle and its velocity to, to within more accurately than this, than this number. Actually, yeah, that, and, and particles behave like waves and stuff, but that's actually just a limit of the description that we are trying to put on it, apparently. That's just a limit of the maths that we're trying to apply on top of it. That doesn't actually describe what the world is like. So it, are you sure it's not invented? Are you sure maths is discovered? Okay, so I think that there is inevitably some aspect of invention. You know, I think that, for example, um, you know, with 10 fingers, we decided to use a base 10. Um, and there are inevitable consequences to that. Um, I like to imagine, you know, maybe there's an alien life form elsewhere that doesn't use the notation that we use, that doesn't write down equations in the same way. And uh, perhaps for them, quadratic equations are like, what? These are the hardest thing. Maybe there's like an unsolved 400 year old quadratic equation that's like, will win a great prize yeah. in the alien world. And yet on the flip side, you know, maybe third order nonlinear differential equations are like a, a piece of this, you know? Yeah. Maybe there are, there is another way to write it all that makes what we find easy hard and make, makes what we find hard easy. I, I certainly think that's true. Right. But I also think that once you get over that hurdle of how you write it and the notation you use, I do think that like, and actually Bertrand Russell spent a long time thinking about this, but, but, I, but I do think that sort of the concept of oneness or two-ness or seven-ness or whatever you like, um, is not an invention. Yeah. I think, you know, there are animals who also have that same ability to count. And I think that the, the, the difference between one object and two objects, we have a language that we have invented to describe it. But I don't think that we have done, I don't think that we've invented, I think that exists outside of us. Um, and so I think that that's really where that, that thing lies. So, okay, so while you're right, the square root of minus one is an imaginary number, might sound like something crazy that's totally invented. At the same time, I think that if oneness is something, I think if squaredness is another thing, then actually, no, I don't think. And, and if negative mm. numbers is another thing that none of which, all of which exist outside of us, then no, I don't think that we have invented imaginary numbers. Right. OK, so it's so it's a limit of the language. Just like with quantum theory, it's a limit of the language, our language, rather than a, a limit of the world the universe well maybe who knows mm. i mean you're getting quite deep philosophical stuff here aren't you but like may maybe it's a limit of the language maybe actually it's the limit of what is knowable i mean or uh yeah yeah may or maybe maybe there are just limits to what science can do mm. Mm. 